Welcome to Raised on D&D Podcast. Raised on D&D brings you inspirational interviews with tips and strategies to enrich your family's gaming experience. Your host for Raised on D&D has been a dungeon master for over 30 years and a father of two three gamers. Here is Nick Cardarelli. Welcome back, gamers. I'm your host, Nick Cardarelli, and this is Raised on D&D. My next guest is originally from London, England, and is currently living in Johor, Malaysia. He's known for his writing articles and speaking at universities. He is partnering with educators, parents, and psychologists on the educational implementation of D&D. You know him on social media as the Educational DM. Please welcome Sam Chung. Hi, Sam. Hi there. Really glad to be here, Nick. Thanks for being on the show. Everybody knows you from your amazing blog articles. We've listened to some of your speaking engagements, especially the one on YouTube from Taylor's University. Um, And we're really excited to hear all of your ideas about Dungeons & Dragons. Take us to when you first started playing tabletop role-playing games in Dungeons & Dragons and tell us your story, how that started. I was uh, always interested in fantasy. I think when I was maybe about six or seven, I got Lord of the Rings from my godmother. And I think I read through it in about maybe 48 hours. And that may seem amazing, but this was on holiday where I didn't sleep. And I was in the car and I was reading the the book. Anyway, uh, my older brother played D&D, and so, and so I visited uh, him, and I, I saw him playing, and I thought, what an amazing thing this is. Um, and he told me stories about it. Um, and then my dad, uh, in a car boot sale, do you guys have car boot sales? Um, oh, yes, uh, like a garage sale. Yeah, it's like that. But you, you, know, you go to this field, and everyone has their car boots open, the back of their car open, and they've, they've got stalls out. Anyway, my dad used to love to visit those. So... He bought the the basic, uh, this is the BX uh, box set um, with a tatty copy of um, of the the, the manual and Keep on the Borderlands and and the really uh, quite horrible plastic blue dice that you had to use a crayon to color in. I'm really sad I've lost those actually. They were in my pouch, uh, dice pouch. I I, I doubt they're back in in London, but... uh, yeah, that, that was my first experience. And, and then I just started, so I started playing uh, being a DM because my brother wasn't really interested in helping me. He, he just said, you could just figure it out yourself. So I taught myself to be a DM, firstly with a small group from church and then with some friends from, from school. And I was about nine or 10 then. This was about ooh, 84, 85. Wow. And did playing Dungeons and Dragons continue through your school years and into university? Through my school years, to a certain degree. So I joined a prep school. This is the the British private school system. uh, Prep school at 10. And so I played uh, with my friends um, there. And I was the dungeon master. And then when I went to uh, the senior school at the age of 13, for the first couple of years, we played, I played a lot of Warhammer fantasy role play. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that was first or second edition, uh, but I have great memories of that. And thankfully, I, I could then not have to be the DM the whole time. Um, that kind of fizzled out, and I got into Warhammer a bit, um, and I still played a little bit. At university, more into board games, and then kind of drifting in and out, playing the occasional game of second edition. I almost completely missed third edition, and then I've come back to it recently with fourth edition, play, trying to play fourth edition with my students, and then just seeing that tipping point between fourth edition and fifth edition, uh, and then I've just taken off with fifth edition. Now, a lot of people don't know, Sam, you're actually a math teacher, is that correct? I am, yes. What grades do you teach? What age groups do you teach? So currently, I'm teaching 13 to 18-year-olds. That's a uh, senior school. Okay. Yeah. Does Dungeons & Dragons make you better at math? Um, My answer is yes, but not in the way that you think. So those people who are do a lot of kind of maths with their job, I don't think it would help in terms of it won't practice your integration, your differentiation, your trigonometry. Uh, I have seen online 
uh, some people working out projectile velocities of certain things. Uh, and I think that's great. And, and there's, a, there's a guy on, online who called Think DM. He's, he's got a fantastic website, who, and he's working out all of these calculations. Now, some you know, DMs will do uh, a decent amount of prob- probability, but even that is, is fairly basic at a uh, sick form level. It doesn't go into university level uh, statistics or probability. Uh, you might practice using spreadsheets. I think that the main two areas that it helps, and this is why I say yes, it does. Firstly, with younger kids, and I, I am talking about kind of up to about the age of 11, 12, from really, really very young, is that it, it makes those number links. Some, I have taught at that level, like, so I have taught all the way down to the uh, eight-year-olds, and with those who are weak at maths, you, we have this little puzzle where you just have to connect uh, numbers that add up to 10 and doing things like times tables. And those basic number links will really help your maths. I, I introduced my children to tabletop role-playing games very early, very early on. Um, for the most part, uh, I provided them with pre-made characters we did very small encounter scenarios, those sort of things, and kind of built up from there. And when they got to that age of uh, seven, eight, nine, because mine are all little stair steps, they have got to roll up their first characters. So they had characters before, but they are all kind of just presented to them, choose a character, right? And this time they wanted to craft their own characters. And so I made them sit down with the books and roll up those sets of stats and find the best one. We figured it out and it was like between the three of them, they did uh, like 136 edition problems with adding up those dice. And, you know, but they had such a great time doing it because I didn't put down a sheet with 136 edition problems. Instead, we, they were creating, they were making, they were doing something and they were doing something fun. I think that's really the hook of Dungeons and Dragons is that as parents, as educators, we don't even have to highlight how this is affecting them in an educational way or in a growth way. It, instead, it's just fun. It's just a good time. It's just uh, entertainment. One of the things that I always drive home is that Dungeons and Dragons creates critical thinking, the ability to look at a situation and work through the problem. So can you talk to us a little bit more about the benefits of the critical thinking? Yeah, I know. I, I completely agree. I think one thing as an educator and as, as a teacher, you, you are in danger of being stuck in the kind of the ivory tower of academia. Um, and one thing I always keep an eye on is, is kind of the news articles that say, what, what is it that, that schools aren't teaching? Uh, and one of the big ones is critical thinking, I think. But it's difficult to define critical thinking. It is that uh, adaptability, it's, a, it's, a, it's problem solving, it's how to apply logic in real life situations on the spot. But definitely there is the, the kind of stereotype of the academic who is really clever and yet a bit of a bumbling fool and you, you put them in the middle of the forest and they, they die, uh, maybe the wizard. Um, but, and, and then the ranger who, who has no clue about uh, civilized life but can find their way through, um, through every, you know, the forests and they know their way around and that they know how to look after themselves. So there is... Um, uh, I described a couple of examples um, in my article. Uh, that, that was my second article. Because I think, for me, that is one of the biggest things for, for Dungeons & Dragons, uh, is the critical thinking. Um, so I described, you know, I, I had a, some students do the um, Treasures of the Lost Horde, Adventures League, you know, um, and actually my, my adult group did this, this exact adventure last night. No, no, it was uh, on Saturday night. Um, and the adventurers come across a mound, a 60 foot mound. Uh, and so my students, um, some of whom were you know, fairly, fairly experienced, they'd been playing for a year or so now, um, 
I said, how are you going to climb the mound? And they said, oh, yeah, we're just going to climb, you know, athletics check, et cetera. And then the wizard, unsurprisingly, fell down um, the first thing. And they said, I said, what are you going to do? Oh, we're just going to wait for him, you know. Um, right. Okay. And then, um, then they got to the top, and then the wizard fell down again, 60 foot this time, was bleeding out on the floor. <laughs> and I asked the group, what are you going to do? And one of them eventually said, oh, I'm going to get one, someone else to, to hold a rope and you know, climb down. And I'm going to put a healing potion in him. Um, and just uh, afterwards, I did stop them. And I think this is the first time I really, really stopped them and said, what could we have done better that session? You know, and they said, they, they were, you know, oh, yeah, we could have used the rope earlier. Then I said, look in your backpacks. Oh, grappling hook, maybe. And then I got them to tease it out a bit further. Maybe we could have sent our best climber up first. Um, and thankfully my adult group managed to do that on Saturday, which was, which was great to see. Um, and I didn't have to worry about that. Um, and it is just that kind of mentality of thinking a little bit through the problem beforehand, thinking about what you've got and how, how to approach it us older folks, we go, what's going to help me climb? When, you're, when we're young, we're like, I can climb 60 foot hill, no problem. <laughs> but when you're older, you go, oh, I could fall. <laughs> and you say, I, I need something to help me. But well, what's in my backpack? <laughs> That's right. So there might, uh, you're, you're right. It's, there's a, a maturity of thinking because there's a, 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 a more sense of risk. <laughs> But I think that that's something that's very interesting. For me, it's really interesting because uh, a lot of these boys and girls, actually, um, but a lot of these students um, that I, I teach have a very strong background in, in playing video games. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference is, and I, I know that video games are great for kind of teaching some skills and teamwork, especially nowadays with the multiplayer games, but the... But usually, in, so even in something like a, a role-playing game, there's usually one way of getting past an enemy or one way of getting into a castle. And, and this is the thing, probably, one of the things I m love most about uh, role-playing games is just the open-endedness of and the innovation you can bring. You know, ge generally, it's up to your wits, your innovation, and what is critical thinking of how to solve the problem that's in front of you. So no two adventures are ever going to be the same, even if you're playing the same module, um, just because of the people in it, just because of the way your Dungeon Master presents it. Yeah, all sorts of factors. That's fantastic. Sam, you mentioned that you are dealing with students that are what, he, what we in the States call middle school to high school, right? So. 13 to 18 year olds, right, right in that range. Now, as a parent of teenagers, one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm noticing is that as a parent, I'm competing a lot, especially with electronics. Okay. So cell phones, uh, the, the Xbox, um, uh, all, social media, all of those things, right? So being able to sit down at the table with them to game is one of the ways that we engage or interact. Can you talk to us a little bit about your experience with teenagers and, and, and helping them engage? Mm, um, absolutely. I think uh, this is one of the reasons why I decided to start yeah, writing my articles, just because I was suddenly understanding my students in a whole new light. My first article was, was about um, the moral values that it can teach. And I was really interested when you were talking to your wife a couple of weeks ago um, about, um, I think the incident was about your son deciding to take a barmaid up to, to his bedroom. Um, and I was fascinated about how you dealt with that. I mean, for me, I would be at the end of the session, just have a sit down with him, have a talk through various things. Well, as you let it run, and um, I think parents, I mean, certainly I've seen so many of my friends' uh, children transition from the age 
maybe eight, uh, seven, eight, year, nine year olds who tell their parents everything. You know, that, their parents are their life and they tell them everything suddenly to become sullen teenagers. I think that's a really difficult transition. And I actually saw it with my, my sister and my niece as well. Um, my sister said she's 12 going on 20 with a, yes. you know, um, and, but having dealt with teenagers most of my career, um, I know that if you treat them like adults and give them their space, you can kind of have a whole different relationship with them. And, but when you play role-playing games, you also start to learn about their morals as a, you know, with the, the, like that example. And I think the, mo the scariest thing for, for parents of teenagers is the influence that they get from elsewhere, not being able to engage with their teenagers um, and not you know, having any say in their learning of morals, moral values. Um, well, as if you are playing something, you're really engaging with them with playing kind of role-playing games, as you are with your, your kids, as so many you know, uh, parents here, who I'm hearing here, you will get to know your, your, your children, your teenagers, uh, and that's incredibly powerful. No, you're absolutely right. It's definitely a playing role-playing games and putting them in not really adult situations, but putting them in uh, life or death situations, um, putting them in uh, moral dilemmas, which a lot of role-playing games are full of, whether you are playing a, uh, a book mission or I personally enjoy, uh, just from storytelling, there has to be some kind of tension. And it doesn't always have to be a Rubik's Cube of moral dilemmas. Um, but sometimes there's a twist in there just to make a good story. You know, um, these people say they're the victims and these are the aggressors. But maybe as the story unravels, you realize that's actually not the case. And now you have to decide as the heroes, as the protagonists of the story, how are you going to approach this problem? And just that simple of a dilemma, just that simple drama for, to make a story exciting is enough to really, when you look and you see the players, now we know as experienced gamers that sometimes when you get people at the table, their personality enhances. And sometimes you get to meet their alter ego. And so, Sometimes just moms and dads out there, grandpa and grandparents, uh, aunts and uncles, just because the teenager um, says, oh, I'm going to punch the bartender in the face because I can, that it doesn't indicate that your teenager would do that to a real bartender. <clears throat> Sometimes the freedom that role-playing games gives them is intoxicating. Uh, eight hours a day, five days a week, they're sitting in classrooms, they're being told to sit still, they're being, getting home, they're being told to do their chores, being told to do their homework. And when you say you are this big, strong, super powered being in a consequence free environment, sometimes they choose to abuse that power, right? And as the dungeon master, as the game master, um, it's important to show them consequences in game to help them understand consequences maybe in real life. And uh, the example that you were giving for folks who didn't listen to the show, um, and you can go back and listen to that episode called My Better Half, um, we, we did. He, uh, he was 10 years old, and uh, he met the, he was a big, brutish, half orc barbarian and he rolled that charisma check with a natural 20 and the beautiful elf maiden falls for him and we think that's it we think okay they're they're sitting at the bar and they're hanging out and they're gonna have a good time and uh, i say well what do you what do you want to do now and the 10 year old says well, I'm, I'm gonna take her up to my room we're in an inn right and i i, I swear my wife almost fell out of her chair <laughs> 
<laughs> and and, uh, and uh, he says, he says, what, what? It's not me. I'm playing my character. <laughs> and, and that conversation, uh, that conversation is so important to have. And I think, um, but uh, as you say, it can emphasize their character and, and allow them to do things that they wouldn't normally do. So I, I did have this conversation with a student who, uh, he's, a really, was a, he's a really nice boy uh, and known to be a, a really nice boy. Um, but we were heading through a town uh, and we were looking after townsfolk because cultists were yeah, burning down the town and attacking people. And he suggested we kind of, we rob the houses. And I was actually another player in this game. So one of the, my other students was, uh, was being the dungeon master. And I said, but they're right there. He said, well, if the houses are burning down. They're not going to use them. They're going to, it's going to be destroyed anyway. <laughs> but, you know, what, what do you think is going to happen if we rob their houses in front of them? You know, um, at worst, they're going to attack us. At, at best, they're going to run away from us because they don't trust us anymore. They think we're horrible people. So it was just fascinating to see his logic here and these, these, uh, these ideas of moral values. Um, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, he's probably, yeah, if it was real life, he would probably think about it a bit more. But just to, to be able to explore that idea with him was great. Yes, and incredibly beneficial. Now, this is a story I don't get to share a lot, and I want to share it with you, um, especially because of your uh, Taylor's University talk. You mentioned uh, Greek mythology. Now, I'm in junior high at the time, which means, um, uh, means I'm about uh, 13, 12, 13 years old, I would say, about that age. And I'm reading Greek, Greek mythology uh, for fun. And there is, a, there is a story about a hero, and he's on the road, and he, he passes an inn. Now, he's been warned about this inn. And he's been told that there, the innkeeper is actually a murderer, a serial mur murderer. Um, yeah, they had those way back then. So the, so the prince, he, he's, he's exhausted from his journey. He's got to stop. He doesn't want to sleep on the road another night. And he goes in. And kind of when he gets in there is when he realizes, oh, my goodness, this is the serial killer's inn. And the serial killer has a bed. And he's heard the story. Whoever lies on the bed, if their legs are too long for the bed, the serial killer chops their legs off to make him fit the bed. And if, you're, if your legs are too short to, fit, to go over the side of the bed, he stretches you out to make you fit on the bed. So the prince in the story, he sees the bed, and the innkeeper murderer says, go ahead, lie down, and see how it fits. And it's then that the red flags go off and he goes, this is the place. Oh no, this is the guy. What do I do? Um, so the prince goes, I don't know how to lie on a bed. And the innkeeper says, what? How do you not know how to lie on a bed? Everyone knows how to lie on a bed. Just lay down. He's like, no, no, no. I've been sleeping outside so much. I, I don't know how to lie on a bed. He goes, well, you lie on it just like on the floor, just like in the ground, just lay down, but on top of the bed. And he says to the innkeeper, perhaps if you showed me the proper way to lay on a bed, I would be able to do it. Now, at this point, the serial killer is so frustrated because by now he would have already killed whoever it was that came to his inn. So in frustration, the innkeeper flops on the bed and he says, see, just like this. And at that moment, as he passes the hero to get onto the bed, the hero begins to draw his sword. And when he turns back and says, see, this is how you lay on the bed, he slays the innkeeper, destroying the serial killer and saving his life. Now, that's a very exciting and uh, interesting story from antiquity, but what relevance does it really have to our lives? So not a year later, I'm in the schoolyard and all the children are mill milling around 
and a young man comes up to me and he says, he says, can you put your hand, he goes, how close can you put your hand to your nose without touching it? You know this game, Sam? I do, I do. <laughs> so, I hear a lot of these. Go on. So they play that everywhere around the world. How close can you put your hand to your nose without touching it? Now, of course, for those uh, folks who got to grow up in places without bullies, um, the way this works is you put the palm of your hand as close as you can to your nose, and while your face is covered by your hand, uh, the other child slaps the back of your hand as hard as he can uh, into your face. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old game and a fun one if you're the bully. But I remember the prince and the serial killer. And I said, what do you mean? I don't understand what you're trying to say. And he says, you put your hand in front of your face as close as you can without touching your nose. And I said, could you show me how it's done so I know what you're talking about? And in frustration, the bully puts his hand in front of his face as close as he can without touching his nose. And he goes, see, just like this. And I slap the back of his hand as hard as I can into his face. Now, that's a plug for literature and, and, uh, and for classical education. <laughs> but role-playing games work the exact same way in showing us scenarios that might build that wisdom skill you were talking about and allow us to avoid situations, embarrassing situations or dangerous situations by having that previous experience, right? So Sam, uh, thank you so much. This was a fantastic conversation and I, I, can't, I can't thank you enough. I mean, just telling, I hadn't heard that story before and, and, and just you telling me that, I, my mind was racing just then, thinking, how is he going to solve this problem? Once you, once you said, um, I'm not used to sleeping on the floor, then I've got it because I've seen, yeah, I've, I've seen that solution yeah, so many times. Um, but yes, I, absolutely. You, you're, you know, when you're presented these problems, you, are, you have so much open, you know, so much... Uh, there's so, much so many possibilities that you can go down in terms of routes. Uh, I think it was um, Deborah, who is it? Uh, Deborah Wall, uh, who, who described, who sh I think she said, uh, if you take 10 different groups and attack a castle, ask them to infiltrate a castle, you will get 10 different ways. Some of them will try and bribe the guard, some of them will hide in a cart, some of them will try and fly over the wall, some of them will try and dig under. And there will be 10 different ways. And that, I think, is so wonderful. Um, and immediately you're getting uh, children and adults to think as hard as they can. They are really kind of ex stretching their brains to, um, to solve these problems. Whereas if I try to get them to stretch their brains that hard in maths, in a maths classroom, but just to get them to work that hard for the fun of it is, uh, you know, is great. It's great to see, you know. You are a big influencer on social media. I've presented in front of groups about Dungeons and Dragons before, and I just have to compliment you, Sam. I had never thought to put a scenario on the board and give the audience time to think about it and discuss it and then come back with their ideas. That, I, I, it was just brilliant. And I, I saw that and I was like, man, I was like, for all the times I've given a presentation, that would have been perfect. Uh, and I wanted, to, I wanted to tell you, I was just blown away. I thought that was the, the best thing ever. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I think for me, I, as, as a maths teacher, I want to engage my audience. Um, I don't actually like hearing myself talk too much. So giving them any group time is, is a great thing and getting them to think and engaging them. So any talk that I do, will, I will try and stop and ask questions and say, yeah, volunteer, kind of, you know, what ideas have you got? I'd love to get your ideas. And, and that, was, that was really important for me. And, and I really, I do want to work on scenarios where, 
and I'm not sure whether this is possible, but yeah, that will specifically hit kind of educational points, things like teamwork, things like uh, communication, things like leadership. I'm not sure whether you can isolate them that though. That's, that's my, what I'm, I'm struggling through at the moment is trying to think how you can isolate those. And I, I will be writing articles on those. That, I mean, there are so many things I can write articles on it from an educational point of view. Um, and I've got so many things in my head, I just don't have time to write them down. Um, but yeah, so thinking about how you can make scenario, scenarios that will hit those specific trigger points, um, or educational ideas is, is going to be difficult. Uh, but certainly, um, I want to be able to do more talks like that and on different things like leadership, like teamwork, like communication. Um, and um, and be able to present a, a scenario like that that, w- that would be that would be great. Um. Well, communication is a big one. Myself being a communication major, one of the things that we've been noticing is that breakdown of interpersonal skills, and everyone's talking about that nowadays. Younger generations are talking to each other not just through text, but now. We're seeing how uh, you mentioned earlier the interactive video games and uh, shall we say the brand of teamwork that's used in those types of scenarios at your school game tables. Do you notice that? Do you notice some of the way they talk to each other in video games coming to the table? In some ways, in broad terms, certainly they they will use terms like tank, uh, which I think, I mean, they may well have been around in the role-playing game um, community before video games, uh, games became really popular, but I think they are much more um, formalized within a, within a video game setting. So people, if you are the tank, you know your role, you're there to soak up damage. So I, I hear them talking about these things and immediately as soon as they use these terms, um, they know, they know what it means. Um, one preteen and two teen in the house. I get to watch them in the wild almost all the time. And those talks, uh, through the mic are crazy. You get an exciting team war game going on, on the video games. And it is constant over there to the right. Where are you going? Oh my goodness. And it's just, it's nonstop. And, and, uh, and I'm in the background uh, trying to be that good dad saying, try and come up with a strategy before you go out the gate. Maybe talk about what your objective is first. And I'm trying, but they're just going, right? It's not, it's never me. <laughs> And so, so those kind of things, when you have the game table, how do you as the dungeon master moderate or help facilitate the conversation at the table? Can you tell us a little bit about that? To be honest with you, I just letting them work those things out for themselves is an, of educational value. They, they generally don't do that much in the classroom, not for strategy. Here in a role-playing game, they, they are solely talking to each other. And the good thing is that it's not under time pressure, unlike in a video game. I actually think that video games are great for that. I mean, people, sometimes if you read my articles, I can be a little bit too harsh on video games. <laughs> Certainly in my first two articles um, on moral values and critical thinking, that those, I've been a little bit harsh on video games. But in terms of teamwork and communication, they are they're amazing uh, at getting them to understand because if they don't work well as a team and communicate, then they, they really suffer, especially against other teams who are working much more slickly together. I think the advantage of role-playing games is that you have your time, the time to, you know, to work out these problems. And occasionally I can give them little hints. So sometimes I might get them to roll an intelligence check if they're not quite understanding something uh, or an insight check, your, your arrows aren't doing as much damage as you would normally expect. And so they have to think and strategize a bit more and maybe support each other more. And then the, again, the, the idea of um, stopping at the end of the session and saying, how could we do that better? 
mm-hmm. you know. Um, and one, one thing I really, I, and I know I disagree with other DMs about this, but actually trying to encourage a balanced party really does help you know, engage even some of the, the shyer ones or the weaker ones. Um, and the, the stronger ones will then be encouraged the, the weaker ones or the, the newer ones to be using their abilities in a certain way because they've seen it done before and they've seen it done in a different way or they know how to optimally use something like bardic inspiration uh, or the help action. And, uh, and that's really good just to, to let them work it out for themselves. I think in, you know, this is almost very opposite to some of the other stuff I do in terms of I'm much, much more happy just to let them explore just to let them do it and actually really talk to each other and, and sit back. And, and if in my session, the less I talk, the better, the more that they are talking to each other. And, and, and very much it's, uh, I will try and be a silent and I'm not afraid of not being afraid of the awkward silence. And, I, and that's something I would recommend for DMs. That's something I would really actually recommend for new teachers is not being afraid of that awkward silence. And, um, my, my head of department would probably um, laugh at this, but he actually sees me walking outside of my classroom a lot because we have, uh, and actually I used to do this in, in back in London as well, so colleagues in my department know that if I've got a good class, but they're silent and they're not really talking to each other when they're working, I will walk out the classroom to let them kind of get on with it. And actually I did that, I think I did that on Saturday night or was it the previous session? I actually said, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. You guys discuss what you want to do with this. And they did. And without the pressure of kind of all the, the kind of dominating presence of the teacher or the, the dungeon master there, they feel much happier to discuss among themselves. That is an excellent tip. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Oh, the dungeon master stepping away from it, from the table. It gives them a moment to talk about it. And also, well, they know that, you, I mean, you're not gone, gone. You're over there making a cup of tea and they know they, they don't feel like you're standing there staring at them, waiting for an answer. But at the same time, they're going, he's coming back. We've got to come up with some kind of plan. Um, I think that's fantastic. That's an excellent strategy. I think I'm going to have to implement that more at my own tables. We love your articles. Are we going to see some kind of publication soon? The idea of book is, is uh, long, long term. I'm not, I'm not looking to, until at least I've pr- published enough articles that maybe I can combine them and then write, you know, do a little bit more to kind of flesh them out. At the moment, what I want to do, uh, move to, is uh, do some interviews, somewhat like you do. I think you're, what you're doing is engaging with parents um, and how to kind of bring Dungeons and Dragons to, to their children. What, is, what I want to do, I really want schools to see Dungeons and Dragons as an acceptable educational tool. So I've already got a repository of past news articles. Some of them talk about how schools are really doing Dungeons and Dragons, using it well to educate the students. Some of them are um, things like um, Dungeons and Dragons or t- role-playing games really helps with teamwork or leadership. Some of them are about the psychological uh, you know, skills, etc. So that's there as a, a tool for teachers and educators to use. Um, I really want them to, to be able to, to make use of that so that they can convince the parents, convince their, their senior management in their schools that this is a really beneficial thing. I think that I would like to engage with summer schools, especially ones linked to schools, and get them running Dungeons and Dragons courses. That's fantastic. We're looking forward to hearing about how things develop. Is there any tips that you can give, any advice that you would give to educators who are in your position and feel the same way you do? about how they could approach their schools, their administration, and how they could present Dungeons and Dragons in an educational way? I think it's a difficult one because I think it depends on how open uh, the senior management are to the ideas of, uh, of Dungeons and Dragons. If there are clubs running it, there are clubs running at most schools. 
And I, I think that most, most schools would be open to you starting a club. And I think that's a great idea. I think with students, it's always the case that if you're enthusiastic about it, then if you can actually get in a conversation with a senior ma management member who is a little bit dubious, that is what my repository of, of news articles is there for. Um, and if you want to do a presentation, certainly I can help with that uh, in terms of uh, thinking about those skills and how, you know, how, to, uh, how to engage with parents and um, senior management. I'm not convinced whether you can use DND in the curriculum. I, I think, uh, sadly, we are, uh, it's, it's too difficult to assess the progress of students, to, of teenagers, um, using Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I mean, I do, I, I love Dungeons and Dragons. I think it's amazing as an educational tool, but to actually assess any progress is so hard. Um, so I think it's going to remain in the extra, extracurricular field for now, unfortunately. Uh, but as I said, summer camps, yeah, uh, extra cl clubs, uh, those kind of things, uh, definitely. Right. Those are the those are the fertile fields for these kind of projects. And uh, I think you're right with the academics. Now we can we can see a measurement in how the game enhances their performance in academics. Um, a lot of times when you when you see students and they've got these skills, you're like, well, what, what extracurriculars are you on? And and they'll say things like, well, my hobbies are reading and history and video games and Dungeons and Dragons. And, and, and there it is, you know, but to be able to say, well, he's been playing Dungeons and Dragons for three weeks. So now we feel like he's right. That's not that's not something conducive to the school. Right, Sam. Thank you so much again. Thank you for being on the show. It's been amazing. We're so excited. We're excited about your projects. Can't wait to read your articles now and in the future. Sam, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.